OK. If anything does come up, feel free to ask questions. But otherwise, we'll just start where we left off, Rutherford's model, right? So in Rutherford's model, and this is just reminders, we talked about this at the end of last lesson, there were these issues, right? Where are all the electrons? Do they collide? Why don't they collide? What's going on with chemical bonding? Didn't know what's going on with the protons. Why are they staying together? Why are they exploding? Aren't they exploding, rather? Um, aren't these orbiting electrons accelerating? Shouldn't they be emitting EM radiation? Shouldn't they be losing that energy and colliding with the nucleus? Why are they out there? Right. So these were the, the four big things that were like, well, this stuff, Rutherford's model doesn't explain these things. These are big questions. Now, before we jump on, we actually have to step back. Remember, Rutherford, this is like early 1900s. We're going to step back to the 1700s for a moment here. Talk about something called spectroscopy. Okay. So, if you remember from light and optics, if we have a prism or we have a diffraction grating, that's going to cause the light spectrum to spread out. And if you remember the diffraction grating equation, as we go from small wavelength to big wavelength, we go from small angle to big angle. So we actually could send white light through a diffraction grating and we'd see the full spectrum appear from violet all the way through to red. Now, if we didn't send pure white light through, Let's say we had a light source that only emitted certain wavelengths. Well, then we wouldn't see the full spectrum from purple to red. We might only see those specific wavelengths. Make sense? Anyhow, in um, the 1700s, a bunch of physicists, inventors, and stuff like that noticed gases could be made to glow by applying a voltage across a tube that was filled with the gas. Anyone know what these uh, eventually became? Yeah, neon signs, right? This is what what they eventually went and were like, hey, let's turn these into signs, right? Um, now, Gustav Kirchhoff, who if you go and take any electrical engineering courses, will either love or hate his various laws. Um, made a whole bunch of sets of observations about gases at different temperatures and different pressures. And he observed certain properties. Okay. Now, this is stuff that you guys need to know. So, hot, dense materials emit a continuous spectrum. There's no dark lines, there's no bright lines, it's just a uniform, continuous spectrum from violet through blue, green, yellow, orange, finally red. And of course, these things also emit in the UV and in the infrared. It's just we don't see that. So we have a hot, dense material. This could be like something that is solid. So we could heat up a chunk of metal. It would emit a continuous spectrum. It could also be something where um, it's a gas, but it's condensed quite a bit. So we've, we've condensed things very, very tightly. Uh, we have molten metal, stuff like that. That makes this continuous spectrum, okay? Now, when we look at a gas at a low pressure, so we've taken a gas, we've emptied the tube for the most part. We only have a small number of particles of that gas in there. Uh, again, on the grand scheme of things, I mean, we still have some pressure. Um, that hot gas at a low pressure will have what we call a emission line spectrum or a bright line spectrum. And the reason why we call it that is if you look at the spectrum, you will see lines of light or of the spectrum at very specific wavelengths. And these characteristic wavelengths are dependent on the element. So if you put hydrogen gas in a tube, you would see this bright line spectrum. A violet line, a blue line, a green line, and a red line. Um, if you put neon gas 
in a tube, you would see a different spectrum. If you put helium gas in a tube, you'd see a different spectrum and so on. And so depending on the spectrum or depending on the gas, we see a characteristic spectrum. Now, it's worth noting, um, if you're big on astronomy uh, and you look at, say, a star, you would see a spectrum for each element in that star. But they're all going to be stuck together. So you're not going to see just hydrogen or just helium or just neon. You're going to see all of them all at once. And so what you'd have to do is you'd have to look at, okay, where are these characteristic lines? Which spectrums are present? Which ones are not? Which lines are there? Do I have everything matched up? And in some cases, some of these spectrums have lines in very similar places. The assignment I've, I've given you guys is to look at some known spectra and then some spectra of unknown samples and identify what elements are present in them based on the line spectra you see. Okay. And so, you know, if you're seeing this pattern of lines in a spectra, then you'd know, well, there was hydrogen in there. And if you saw other lines in there, then there'd have to be other things too, but you know there would be hydrogen. That kind of makes sense. Um, if we have a gas at a low pressure, so again, low pressure for both of these, we're not dealing with dense materials it will absorb the light that it would have emitted when it was heated. So if I shine light through hydrogen, for example, at a very low pressure, I'm going to see dark lines at these points here, the same points where I saw the bright lines when it was heated. So I'm shining white light through cold or cool hydrogen at a low pressure, it's going to absorb light of those specific wavelengths. And this is what we call a absorption line spectrum or a dark line spectrum. Okay. And you need to be aware of the terminology here, right? So continuous spectrum, emission or bright line spectrum, absorption or dark line spectrum. Okay, um, and this is something scientists notice that, okay, well, the same characteristic wavelengths show up again here, it's just now it's being absorbed. Now, um, a guy by the name of Josef von Fraunhofer uh, did a whole bunch of careful measurements of the sun. And he saw that there were all these dark lines scattered all throughout the entire spectra of the sun. Now, most of the time you don't see them because they're a single wavelength and they're surrounded by a lot of light coming in of a wavelength just a little higher, just a little lower that is, well, as bright as the sun. So unless you look through a very, very careful apparatus, um, it can be really hard to see these. Uh, and so, um, you know, careful measurements led to this sort of spectrum and then comparisons were made with you know absorption spectras of elements that we saw on Earth and we went okay uh, based on these lines one of the lines down here that's in purple one that's in blue one that's in green one that's in red uh, then oh hydrogens in the Sun And so that was a that was kind of a, a key factor in us being able to understand what elements are present in other planets or in suns and stars and things like that is by looking at these light spectras. Any questions about that so far? Now up to this point we haven't talked about this, but this was one other thing that models of the atom had to explain. Why does hydrogen produce this absorption spectrum? Why does it produce this emission spectrum? What the heck's going on? Well, we get past Rutherford's model 
And Johann Balmer, who was studying these, came up with a mathematical formula for the way the lines were produced from hydrogen. So, and we don't need to use this equation. So don't write this equation down. Don't worry about it. Don't stare at your formula sheet and go, it's not on here. Oh no, do I have to memorize it? This is just for our own understanding. Now we look at this. Does anything stand out in that equation as something that, you know, links up to stuff we've talked about already? I mean, we've got wavelength here, which we'd expect, right? We're predicting where lines of a certain wavelength should show up. Yeah, n. This n comes up again, and it's the same thing. It's it's like a index. It's like one, two, three, four. One of those, something like that, right? It's a counting number again and you've got it right on it's that draws us back to this idea of quantum mechanics right so something strange is going on here where this is this n number showing up again niels bohr saw this so interesting thing when we talk about atomic models thompson came up with his model from an experiment he did Rutherford came up with his model from experiments his group did. Bohr came up with his model based on experiments other scientists did and the results they got from them and then he understood what they were missing. Right, So he took that evidence and kind of turned it into or, or explained what was going on from there. So he realized that these spectral lines probably meant that there were differences in quantized energy levels within hydrogen. Now remember, we, we've already talked about this idea of the potential of quantized energy levels from de Broglie, right? When you have a wavelength or you have an electron working as a wave, it's got to form standing waves. And so if it's orbiting something, well, there's only certain radiuses of orbit that standing wave can can form it. Okay. Um, so his idea was that each of these lines corresponds to a electron moving between one energy level and another energy level. So he made a bunch of suggestions or amendments to Rutherford's model. So the first one was electrons can only orbit the atom at certain fixed distances. And the distances are specific multiples of the smallest orbit. So you have an orbit, I don't know, let's say it's 10 nanometers. Well, you might only then be able to orbit at 40 nanometers, 90 nanometers, 160 nanometers, for example. So those orbital radii are quantized. So this was a really key thing, okay? Um, because before that, electrons could be anywhere, right? We think back to this this list of of topics. He's answered this one right here, this first one. Are all the electrons in the same orbit? Well, they may be but they're in fixed orbits. They can't just be in any orbit. Second thing that came out of his work was that the kinetic energy and the potential energy of any electron depend on the distance from the nucleus. Now, if we think about it, the potential energy makes sense. The further it is away from the nucleus, the change in forces, the change in energy and stuff. But as it turns out, the kinetic energy also depends on it because of that standing wave stuff. So then energy was quantized. So each orbit corresponds to an electron having a specific energy. And if you think back to when you've heard about this model before, you'll probably be going, okay, that's what those things meant. That's why we called them energy levels, stuff like that. 
And the final amendment he made, and this was one that explained this uh, spectrum phenomena, was that an electron can only move between energy levels by either emitting or absorbing energy equal to the difference. Now here's where things get a little interesting because he says unless an electron moves between orbits it doesn't radiate energy. Now you might go well wait a minute if it's still orbiting is it accelerating still? Because if it's accelerating shouldn't it have to emit EMR? If it's not accelerating what's going on? How is it moving such that it stays within a certain area but it doesn't accelerate? Um, that's going to be something that you'll need to take further quantum mechanics classes to, to dig into. Um, but physicists kind of use a, a interesting terminology here. Because the size and the shape of the orbit stays constant, physicists usually call those orbits stationary states. Now the weird thing is the electron is still moving within that state. But we call it a stationary state because the size, the energy, everything else about it stays very similar. So these would be the key amendments to that Rutherford made, or Bohr made to Rutherford's model. Electrons are at certain fixed distances. Energies are at certain fixed amounts, depending on where the electron is. And then the one that's most critical to us uh, in Physics 30 and problems with Physics 30 is electrons can only move between energy levels by either emitting or absorbing energy. The amount of energy they have to emit or absorb is equal to the difference between the energy levels. Any questions about that so far? Is this starting to sound a little bit more familiar, a little bit closer to like what you've heard of with for, with Bohr's model before. Now, talk about energy level diagram. So, a energy level diagram it's just a graphical way to think about the energy levels the electron could possess. Okay. There's a weird convention in physics which sets that an electron that's out of the atom is going to have zero energy. Now you might think, well wait a minute, if it's out of the atom it has zero energy, how does that work? Well, it's kind of like if we thought about an object on the ground having zero energy. Well, if it's held more tightly than being on the ground, that must mean it's in a hole. and so. It's kind of like that potential energy thing where we could set zero to be wherever we want. So when we refer to electron energies that are in an atom, they're going to be negative. And this is just a convention. So you'll see it referred to in this way. Um, and it might seem kind of strange, but it's a bit easier because each atom is going to have different minimum energies, right? Depending on the atom, it's going to hold that lowest energy electron more tightly or more loosely or stuff like that. So if you always made that zero, then if you compared between two different atoms, the electron that was free from the atom would have a different energy depending on which atom you start it with. So it's easier to just make electrons that aren't attached to an atom, zero energy. Okay. Now what this looks like is it looks like something like this. So here's hydrogen. So up here this top energy level, zero electron volts, that's a free electron. So that's an electron that is not actually orbiting this hydrogen atom. Okay. Um, and then if we were to talk about these levels, this would be the first, this would be the second, this would be the third, fourth, fifth. Now you might say, well, is there no sixth energy level? Well, there is. 
they start getting really tight as we get closer to the top. Um, so this is kind of kind of interesting. Now if we had an electron here, if we wanted to knock it up to this energy state, we'd have to give the difference in energy. So we'd have to give it 10.2 electron volts to get it from negative 13.6 up to negative 3.4. That makes sense. If it dropped back down, it would have to give up that same amount of energy. So let's do a, a quick little check here. And when they drop, whatever energy they give up comes out as a photon. So if we have a electron in the fourth energy level right here, and it drops down to the second energy level, what wavelength of light gets emitted? Well, we need to figure out our difference in energy here. The energy of our photon. Uh, incidentally, if you haven't seen this before, uh, the Greek letter gamma is often used for uh, photons. It, it looks like an alpha that's diving downwards. Um, so we have our initial energy, we're subtracting our final energy from it, so we're going to, uh, if we want to figure out how much energy the electron gained or lost, we're going to do 3.04 minus that. Uh, we get out, anyone got that one figured out already? negative 2.55, now that's how much energy the electron lost, uh, which is consequently the positive of that is how much the photon gains. So our E photon, this is really going to be like the positive of all this stuff. So we'll actually have our photon, we'll have positive 2.55 electron volts. And now we could figure out the wavelength by using our HC over lambda equation solve for a wavelength. Anyone got that one figured out already? Anyone figure out that wavelength out? Good practice for your chapter uh, C2 test. Yeah, so Evan's the only one who brought a calculator today. 487 nanometers. Uh, what color would that be? Ballpark. Green, uh, it's actually kind of this uh, blue guy here, I think. I think this one's like five something. Um, but it, so, so this line right here, that is caused by a photon moving from orbit four to orbit two. It's fine. I Mostly guys, I, I ask these questions so that you can start developing that sense of wavelength, right? Because it's tricky when we've got such a wide range. Yeah, if it's like 410, you know it's violet, and if it's like 700, you know it's red, but in the middle, it's kind of hazy. So, um, so that's what gives us that blue line. Now, we could look at some other ones if we want to, and we'd find one where, okay, it gives us the green line, or the violet line, and one where it gives us a green line, one where it gives us a red line, and so on. So, all these various transitions would form up some sort of spectra. Now, you might be thinking, well, wait a minute. I was told in chemistry, electrons are always occupying the lowest energy state. 
how the heck did the electron get up to level 4? And if it's in level 4, why isn't it just going all the way down to level 1? Well, it will probably get to level 1 eventually, but how it gets there is variable it might drop down through any of these paths. You kind of think of it as if you were walking, you know, several blocks away diagonally, you might go north first and then west and then north again, or you might go north for two blocks and then head west, or, right? There's lots of different possibilities. It's the same thing for the electron. It can take lots of different ways down. In terms of how it ended up in that higher state, well, remember, these emission spectra were being created by running electrical current through these gases. So the electrical current was providing that initial energy. It was taking the electron that was happily sitting down level one, it was knocking it all the way up to level four, and then that electron had to work its way back down. So that's how some of that happens. Okay. Incidentally, you also sometimes refer to level one or the lowest energy level as the ground state. You might have heard that term before. Any questions about this problem or this diagram? Okay. Now, basically we could go back through here. We could find, you know, energy level transitions for all these other lines. If you're really curious about it, you can play around with it and figure it out. Um, but all these bright line spectra are just from electrons dropping from one energy level to another. Energy they give off has to go off as a photon. No other way to do it. Okay. And I think if we look at uh, 3 and 2, that gives us our green, I believe and then uh, 5 and 2 gives us our purple and then I don't have the one that gives us a red on this diagram. Okay, so that was emission spectra. Now we're going to talk about absorption spectra. So there's a couple ways we could get energy absorbed by the electrons in the atom we could have a particle come in and hit it, like an electron, or we could have a photon come in and hit it. Those are our two options. Now, let's say we have a bunch of electrons. So these are all electrons here, they're all coming in and they have these kinetic energies. Okay, 12 and a half, 11, and six electron volts. And our hydrogen atom is going to have we're just going to look at three cases. It doesn't actually have three electrons. Don't don't go complain to me to your chemistry teacher. If I was your chemistry teacher, don't go complain to me. Um, so we're going to label three of them. Okay. Now, we need to think about what's going to happen with each of these cases. Let's start with case one. Where can that electron go? It comes in with 12.5 electron volts of energy. It collides with this electron right here. What are the possible outcomes for this electron? You know, what energy levels can it go to? Again, here's one, two, three, four, etc., all the way up. Where might this electron number one end up? could end up at level three, right? And if it ends up at level three, this electron here that left, so if we go from one up to three, our free electron, how much energy does it have left over? Because remember, electrons don't have to give up all their energy, right? Uh, they only have to give up part of it. So how much energy does that photon have left over? Or sorry, that electron have left over. Well, the difference between level one, level three is 12.09 electron volts. 
So this electron comes in, it loses 12.09 electron volts to get up here. What's left? 0.41 electron volts. So our electron comes in, it collides, it gives up almost all its energy, and it leaves with just a tiny little bit left over. Is there any other possibility for the electron down here? Could it end up in any of the other states? Yeah, it could also end up in state number two. You might think, well, wait a minute, it has enough energy to get it to state three. Why would it possibly end up in state two? Well, the answer there is we don't always have these perfect collisions where all our energy gets lost or transferred. So in the case of going from one up to state two, how much energy does our electron leave with? Well, we do the same thing as before, right? We find the difference in the energy levels. That tells us how much energy this one had to lose. And then we figure out what's left over. Yeah, there we go, 2.3 electron volts. Someone else brought their calculator today. That makes sense. We could do the same thing for electron number two. Where does electron number two end up? Where can it end up? Can it end up anywhere other than doing the one to two transition? No, it can't. It just doesn't have enough energy, right? If we look at our 13.6, our difference, our 3.4, well, when we take that energy, it uses all its energy but 0 0.8 electron volts. That's all the energy that it has left after doing that transition. Well, that's not enough to get it all the way up to 3 as well. That makes sense. Now what about electron number three? What happens with electron number three? Yeah, this doesn't have enough energy. It cannot move this electron because it needs that minimum amount, that 10.2 electron volts to just get it out of state one. So for three, we're just going to see the electron leave with six electron volts of kinetic energy. Even if it hits this electron, it's going to rebound off it completely elastically. It's going to keep all its energy. This electron's just going to stay there. Okay. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? Okay, so no they don't, Sierra, um, but quite often I'm going to be specific about where the electron that's being collided with in the atom is. And for simplicity, it is most commonly going to be a ground state electron, but I'm going to tell you where it is. Now, the reality is if we have a neon light, we've got a whole bunch of electrons coming in with the same energy level energy some of them are bumping electrons up to say two those electrons hang out in energy level two for a little while another electron might hit them and bump them up even higher before they start dropping down so reality is a lot more complicated we have a lot more electron transitions happening we have a lot more electrons coming in if i'm asking you a problem i'm going to be really specific a electron with this energy comes in and collides with a electron in energy level whatever ground state two three four whatever um, if i ask you what possible energies you could see come out you need to check 
if there's one or there's two. Because if there's if we're in a situation like state one, then we could have both come out. Now the reality again, if we have an electron up in state three and we're hitting it with all these, it could go all over the place, right? But yeah, it, it, in a problem, it's going to be very um, tightly dictated. I'm not going to ask you, hey, we shoot 15 electron volt or 12.5 electron volt electrons at this. What are all the possible combinations that come, can come out? You'll be be doing addition and subtraction for days. Uh, yes. So these ones here, these are what ha the electron that comes in. So like really what's going on is this electron, like electron two comes in, hits this, and then bounces off and leaves. That electron will leave with 0 0.8 electron volts of energy. This one is now up here in state two it's hanging out there for a little while eventually it'll drop back down and it'll emit a photon that has 10.2 electron volts of energy any other questions uh, no it does not right remember the the idea behind Bohr's theory is a electron at an energy level has a specific amount of energy so one at this energy level has three point negative three point four electron volts of energy. One down here, negative thirteen point six. One up here, negative one point five one. And it might be weird again to think about that, but remember that would just be like calling zero gravitational potential energy the top of your bookshelf, and then as you slot it books into different shelves, they'd have negative energy. Okay. Now with photons, things get a little bit more interesting. Photons can only exchange energy in discrete packets. E equals HF, right? So let's do the same thing with photons. And one, two, and three. And again, we have our three electrons down here. One, two and three. Now photons it's all or nothing right? They either give up all their energy or they give up none of their energy. So photon one comes in. What are my possible options for my red electron? Where does it end up? notice I'm having to be a lot more precise with these right 12.09 it goes to level 3 because the difference between these two levels that difference that energy between 3 and 1 is well 12.09 EV what about number 2 11 EV where does that one go Well, we got to be careful here. Remember, my photon can only exchange exact amounts of energy. So how much energy would it take me to get from 1 to 2? Well, if you look ahead, you can see that photon 3 is going to have enough energy to get me from 1 to 2. But photon 2, it cannot exchange 11 electron volts. That would put my electron like here that's not a valid energy level. Electrons can't be there. So it doesn't move. In fact, if we shone photons with these three energies at this gas, what we'd see is we'd see a photon come out at 11 electron volts. The other two would get absorbed. 
one transitioning from one to three, the other transitioning from one to two. Now you might be thinking, well, why do we get absorption? We get this dark line spectrum, right? Why do we get absorption? Won't those electrons drop back down and re-emit that photon? And you're right, they will. But when they emit that photon, it'll go out in all directions. But it's just one photon. So if I'm shining, you know, 7,000 photons straight at you, and they all get absorbed, and then they get re-emitted in all different directions, it's going to be a really, really tiny fraction that are still heading straight at you. Does that make sense? So that's why we see these dark lines, and that's why we call it a dark line spectrum, not a black line or absence of light or something like that spectrum, because they're just darker than the surrounding light. But each of these lines would correspond to some photon transitioning, you know, from, from one place to another. Now, the red and the blue aren't these two, but that's a general idea. Any questions about that? So, a couple key differences between how electrons and how photons come in. Electrons can give up partial amounts of energy. We get any electron coming in, we'll get an electron bouncing out. Photons, it's all or nothing. They can only give up all their energy or they give up none of their energy. So if we have a photon that matches one of these transitions, it will get absorbed. If it doesn't match one, it will go straight through. Any questions about that? Okay. Now, yes, match exactly. Uh, I mean, within a little bit of hand waving, right? Um, depending on whether you use like Planck's constant or uh, joule seconds or electron volt seconds, then you might encounter some like slightly offness to it. Um, generally speaking, I'm not going to be trying to give you one that's like close, but yeah, it should match exactly. If you're noticing, like let's say your transition value is like 12.12 and you get 12.1201 as your energy, work under the assumption that there's probably just a little bit of fudge factor going on with your values that I, I truncate it down to uh, energy or something at some point. But yeah, it, it theoretically should be matching exactly. I'm not going to throw one at you where it's like just a tiny little bit above and see whether or not you're like playing chicken with did you round right or not. Um, so it's it's going to be it's going to be either really really close to matching exactly, and then it should be considered a exact match, or it's going to be further away from it and then it won't be an exact match. Anyhow. So let's talk about quantization of the atom. This is just some some side notes. Um, you don't need to know any of the equations on here. Energy levels are quantized. They relate to the lowest allowed energy level, E1. So you're wondering where I got all those various numbers for the energies. It's E1 at 13.6 divided by n squared. And that n is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, etc. called the principal quantum number. You don't need to know this equation. You don't need to use this equation. Orbits are also quantized. They relate to the smallest orbit, r1. And it's r1 times n squared. You don't need to know this equation. You don't need to use this equation. You need to do nothing with this equation. For hydrogen, we have these very specific values for r1 and e1. And you might think, well, this is really easy. I could do this for any atom. I just need to know the E1 for that atom and the R1 for that atom and everything's great. The problem is it works great for hydrogen. It breaks down as we move to larger atoms. 
And if you take quantum physics courses in university, if you are a physicist, you will stop at hydrogen and kind of dust your hands off and walk away going, and now we've explained the atom using quantum. And if you're in chemistry, you'll get to hydrogen and you'll look at it and go, well, why did physicists stop here? And then you'll have to make approximations and do the math for everything else because chemists are interested in more than just hydrogen. Okay, So this was a problem that it breaks down with this move to larger atoms. Uh, we're not going to deal with why or how this works exactly, but I am going to hands wave our way through it for just a little bit here if we're good to stick around. Um, moving on. So things you need to know again. Why was Bohr's model so much better than Rutherford's? Um, the atomic radius he calculated, the ionization he calculated from his theory matched hydrogen's properties that were known. This is a good thing, right? Any model you come up with, the predictions of that model should match the reality of the world. So this was good. Before that, we didn't have great measurements or, or ways to predict atomic ra radius or predict ionization energy. We didn't have a lot of information that told us, oh, based on this physics, here's what those values are. Instead, we knew the values, but we didn't have any reason to go, oh, and that's why those values are what they are. So this was a win, right? Again, as we get to better and better models, we should have them checking off more boxes about stuff where the model matches the experimental reality. So if you're asked, hey, why is Bohr's model great? You could talk about this. It explained spectral lines. And I know you might be thinking, well, Mr. Owen, you just explained that spectral lines were a thing today. Uh, why weren't we complaining about them with Rutherford's model? We were, but made a lot of sense to just talk about what the heck these things were when they became relevant. It explains a lot of patterns found in the periodic table. So there's a bit of other stuff in terms of how those electrons fill those energy levels. And if you think about your Chem 20 or your uh, Science 10 or stuff like that, well, electrons having one electron in your valence shell you have certain properties. Two electrons, you have certain properties that you share. Almost full, you have certain properties that you share, and so on. And so this started explaining what the heck was going on with some of those valence shells. It also explained where the heck the electrons were around the nucleus, what was going on with it. Okay. There were some problems, though. Anyone know what Rutherford or Bohr's model doesn't yet explain? Yeah, it doesn't explain bonding. We still haven't gotten there yet. There's another big one. Yeah, it doesn't explain how the nucleus stays together. So those were still problems. Another one that was interesting or, or things that came up that you guys wouldn't be aware of yet. Um, I mean, it worked great for hydrogen. Other elements, you had to really kind of tweak things a lot. Um, and that was a little bit strange. Finally, it could not explain spectral line brightness. So uh, usually around now would be where I'd break out a bunch of gas discharge tubes. They're basically like little mini neon lights and we'd all take a look at them through spectroscopes and, and spend a lab day looking at pretty colors. Um, here we are. So, uh, you know, you get to start seeing weird spectral line behaviors. And um, if you actually hold magnets near them, you can see those spectral lines start to shift or in some cases split. And where there was one line, now there are two lines and stuff like that. So there was a lot of interesting stuff that was going on there that wasn't explained by this. So clearly we were missing something else. Okay, this is where your knowledge for Physics 30 needs to end. I, I know we're running kind of long here. Um, if you have to go to do something else, you are by all means welcome to go. I'm going to talk a little tiny bit 
about the quantum model it won't take that long so if you do have to go have a lovely day um, remember to do your c2 test uh, ideally before tomorrow but if you can't for some reason just send me an email um, and there is that spectral line assignment up on d2l now it shouldn't take you that long quiz on this stuff coming up on thursday or friday of this week and will be open for a couple of days so if you gotta go have a lovely afternoon good evening and we'll see you on thursday morning at 10 if you're wanting to stick around a little bit i promise i won't take very long with this so there we are so last little bit again this stuff not on any tests not on any quizzes so we go back to de Broglie's idea particles behaving like waves electrons orbiting atoms they're going to have a wave light path orbit must produce a standing wave we'd have that 2 pi r n would equal n lambda and that r n and that n here increase so as we go up by orbits we go up by quantum number so fun so this de Broglie theorem right that explains why the electrons have to be quantized the fact that we have to have this integer number of wavelengths for that circumference that explains why we have to be quantized now what does this mean when we get to the quantum model everything becomes a little strange so we no longer can consider an electron as being a particle in a specific location we no longer consider an orbital as being a line right a orbit of a certain radius where the electron follows around like a planet orbiting a star we now want to think about these in terms of that radius provides a kind of boundary a area in which the electron may be found and it becomes a probability rather than a oh the electrons there so when you get into quantum physics we start talking about this idea that okay there's a probability the electrons in these locations and we could calculate that probability um, and then our orbits stop becoming lines and they start kind of becoming clouds so what some of those clouds look like is something like this so this is going to look very interesting if you guys think back to chemistry how many electrons are found in the first energy level two how many are found in the second energy level eight okay now there's a fun little thing that we don't talk about in high school but it limits the number of electrons to an orbital two so in our first orbital it's a sphere that's it right here that's our first orbital that's our lowest energy level when we get to our second energy level we have the sphere again a little bit bigger and then we have these kind of weird blobs and they're almost like weird figure eights like if you imagined two balloons that you blew up and you tied them together knot to knot now what these show and there's one that goes on the x-axis and one that goes on the y-axis and the z-axis um, these are showing the probabilities of where the electron in that orbit is so if we've got electrons in the first energy level they're probabilistically within this tiny little sphere about the nucleus when we get to the second or energy level there's an orbital that is a slightly bigger sphere can hold two electrons and then there's these orbitals that are kind of these figure eight shapes incidentally the probability of it being at the center of it is zero and you might think well that's interesting I guess one electron sits in each blob uh, no it doesn't the electrons could both be in one blob or both be in the other yet somehow they can move from one side to the other without ever passing through the middle where there's a probability of them being zero confused yet this is why we don't generally talk in great detail about the quantum model 
And you might look at this and go, okay, so I got figure eights. Yeah, that's exactly what's happening, Evan. Uh, quantum tunneling, if you've heard of it, basically it's an electron, just punches through where it's not allowed to be to get to somewhere where it is allowed to be again. Um, now, you might think, well, we got figure eights, we got spheres, I can handle that. Third energy level, we're used to saying there's eight, right? Uh, but really there's 10 extra ones in there. It's just those 10 have a higher energy level than the first orbit of the fourth shell. So if you've ever wondered why transition metals are weird, it's these energy level values. Now what do all these orbits look like? Well, there's our first one. We call it S. I think it comes from German. There's your three P orbitals. One aligned along the X, one aligned along the Z, one aligned along the Y axis. Two blobs to get connected together. When we get to the next one, and again, this is why transition metals are weird. These are the orbitals that the transition metals are starting to inhabit. We start getting kind of off-matched spheres. And then this one that has a ball, a big blob, and then a little ball. And uh, if you go far enough to the lanthanide and actinides, then you start getting these guys show up, the f orbitals, and they start looking really wonky. Now, uh, I know some of you guys took or are taking, yeah, uh, AP Chem. Did you guys talk about SPDF orbital hybridization at all? Okay, so these are what those SPDF orbitals actually look like when you look at the probabilities, and you may have talked about those. And then you might think, well, how does this explain bonding? It turns out the orbitals, when you get bonds happening, kind of hybridize and join together. And instead of looking like a sphere or a cloud or something, it might look like here's a little blob and then you've got a giant blob over here. And so the electrons occupy this area very low probability, much higher probability that they happen on one side of the atom here. And then you'd get a bunch of these at different angles, depending on how they hybridize. And if you measure the bond angles between the predictions, you get that 109.5 bond angle showing up. You get all those other things showing up. We're not going to dig into it very much. This is me hands waving you into the, don't worry, the quantum model does actually explain chemical bonding. Um, you don't need to know any of this for your test, for your assignments, for your quiz. This is only so we have just a tiny little glimpse of uh, where your life might be heading if you're going into chemistry uh, or physics at university. Okay, uh, that's all for today. So um, 